Spiritual Warfare is an unlicensed adventure game with some very light RPG elements. You play as what can only be described as a warrior of faith, and your mission is to acquire the six pieces of the armor of God, which apparently didn't include pants, in preparation to destroy the ultimate evil. To say that this game is heavy-handed on the Christianity spectrum is a huge understatement. A lot of games from the company Wisdom Tree tell some humorously twisted versions of Old Testament stories, like Baby Moses or Noah's Ark, but Spiritual Warfare completely carves out a brand new quest instead. You step into the shoes of a modern-day Christian protagonist trying to spread the good word to sinners they encounter. Every single thing in this game, from the equipment you find to the people you assail in the streets, right down to the fruits you whip at them, all have direct ties to scripture. I grew up as a church-going Catholic, so none of this content was a problem for me personally, but for someone who doesn't like to mix this kind of messaging in with their gaming experience, I could see a game like this being off-putting. Coming from my background, I find these spins on religious storytelling intriguing, and if you dig down beyond the doctrine layer, there's a pretty solid adventure that not only brought me some great laughs, but also challenged me in the way that only games from this generation can. Like another very famous game that you'll likely think of a lot while we talk about spiritual warfare, you'll start off empty-handed but soon stumble upon your first weapon, a pear. Actually, all weapons that you pick up on this quest are fruits that parallel the biblical fruits of the spirit. Instead of being a metaphorical representation of how to live a good life, here they serve as ammo to hit unbelievers with to convert them into Christians. And yes, that's straight out of the manual. You can clobber them with fruits representing love, faith, and so on. This beats the devil straight out of them and causes them to fall to their knees for a final prayer just prior to being raptured off the face of the earth. It seems harsh, but what good faith-bearing soldier would use actual weapons to destroy ordinary, everyday people? Only real sinners use real weapons, but we'll get to that a bit later. When comparing the fruit types, there are some differences to consider, mainly in their speed and range, but there's an interesting weapon leveling system to experiment with as well. The more of one kind of fruit that you purchase or find, the more that you can have on screen at once. The best comparison that I can think of are the multipliers from Castlevania that let you throw more sub-weapons. Unlike those games where the benefit only lasts until you die, when you upgrade a fruit in Spiritual Warfare, it's permanent, so it's very worthwhile to spend time looking for shops and secrets. As thoroughly as I searched, I still didn't come close to finding all of the fruit upgrades. There were a few tricky spots in the game where having maxed out weapon ability would have made things easier, but I still found the game quite manageable without it. There's a few circumstances where particular fruits were necessary to get through a screen, but you could mostly play with your preferred attack. I liked having the option to switch between them freely and to try out different strategies rather than being locked in. For the majority of the adventure, I threw the slow-moving apples because they didn't disappear once they struck the target like many of the other fruits did. They kept moving through enemies to those beyond, but towards the end of the game, people became too fast to take down this way, so I switched to the grapes that are more like a spread gun equivalent. The combat can get pretty intense, but you have plenty of tools in your arsenal to adapt to the challenges that you get presented with. Unless you need to get past animals, those soulless monsters are unaffected by fruits and you'll have to try to avoid them, but that's not always possible. The variety in enemy patterns, strength, and strategy kept the very frequent combat interesting, and while I'd sometimes get totally destroyed despite my best efforts, that was just part of the fun. The enemies you face off with are people from all walks of life. Greedy businessmen, prisoners at a jail, slumlords, and delinquent spray painters but all of them can be ruthlessly pelted with fruit to bring them around to the side of your mission. The villain roster was the part of the game that made me laugh the most because many of the choices seemed completely random. Right next to people clearly committing heinous crimes like attempted murder in street shootouts were construction workers breaking up concrete or people wearing bathing suits at the beach. One of the core principles of Christianity is that no person is without sin. But seeing the game's creators point fingers at people of a specific trade or job felt not only a little uncomfortable, but also unintentionally hilarious. I guess they had to choose something to pit against the main character, but I think this is one aspect of the game that could have been handled a little more tactfully. I'm sure there's a Bible verse somewhere that lists the kinds of people that need saving, and I'm pretty sure they weren't casino users or sailors. Even plains clothes people would have felt more appropriate than these callouts. On the theme of shaming, Spiritual Warfare also takes things one step further to make sure that your own protagonist's mind is clear from the temptations of evil. As you search around the different areas of the game, you'll want to duck into all the buildings with open doors to see what they have on offer. Some of them hold extra prize items or keys for the taking, but it would seem that a warrior of faith is supposed to have an innate aversion to certain establishments. 
I naively thought that going into a bar might be a good place for a boss fight or maybe even a cutscene, but apparently even stepping through the doorway of a place like that deserves punishment from the opportunistic, all-seeing eyes of angel minions. I was immediately stripped of one of my pieces of armor and had to wander through a terrifying slum filled with criminals to get it back. And it's not just in a heap somewhere in a back alley either, they make you buy it back with spirit points. These are your currency in-game that can be found or picked up after defeating enemies, but what a way to drive a point home. This punishment system was so outlandish that it cracked me up more than anything else. It was so funny that I dared enter other buildings further down the line just to see if the same thing would happen. And you bet it does, and the consequences are even worse, but it was still worth it. Like many other adventure games just like this, broader access to different parts of the world become available as quest-related items are found. Some of the pieces of armor you're after don't only provide increases to offense or defense, they also have useful properties that allow you to interact directly with the overworld. You can push blocks out of your path after you find the belt of truth, or walk across red-hot pavement into uncharted territory with the boots of the gospel. There are also a set of very strange sub-items that are so eccentric that they felt like more of a parody than anything else. The vials of the wrath of God emulate bombs in their function. God must have an awful lot of wrath because you can find these vials pretty much everywhere. Warehouses, caverns, in plain sight on the overworld, you name it. They can cause an explosion to not only reveal secret passages, but to also compel enemies into repentance. And then there's Samson's jawbone. Its role is just like the boomerang in Zelda games in that it picks up things that are far away to retrieve them, but I couldn't help but grin every time I saw that toothy mandible flying around the screen. This is a reference to a man murdering a thousand people with the jawbone of an ass, and why they chose this particular item of all the things they could have possibly chosen from the Bible is beyond me. It just seems a little silly. One part that I really enjoyed were the boss fights. There's quite a bit of puzzling to do throughout Spiritual Warfare, but each boss encounter has its own unique strategy to sort out. The solutions were learning to fight your opponents indirectly or by manipulating the surroundings, and these were genuinely challenging to work through. The answers didn't always make the most sense, and the only complaint that I have is that it was sometimes difficult to tell if you were making any progress. There was practically no feedback to you as the player to indicate that you were thinking in the right direction, and sometimes while I was throwing vials of wrath around or spewing fruit in all directions, victory would be won and I wouldn't know how or why. At the end of the day, there's only a short list of things to try, but learning how to deal with problems by putting violence aside was a welcome change from the usual means of hitting things repeatedly until they die. In terms of the game's progression flow, except for once or twice, I never really struggled with where to go next. Each region has a couple of connecting points that are either open to walk into freely or are blocked by an obstacle that you'll need to find an item to get past. If you're really not sure, you can always track down these Christian helpers that are primed with information and tips on what to look out for. They'll let you know what the next goal is or if you're on the right track and were actually extremely helpful on the scale of NPC usefulness. Spiritual Warfare seems to go out of its way to keep you on track as much as possible, going so far as to include a very detailed walkthrough section in the manual to teach you how the game works. That tutorial, along with competent in-game directives, really made this stand out among other games from the time. The difficulty felt well balanced too, as I found the different pieces of armor and was better equipped to succeed in scuffles with non-believers, it gave me a real feeling of character progression. There's lots of good indicators to let you know if you end up somewhere that you're not supposed to be yet, but a saving grace are these guardian angels that descend from the sky. If you touch one, you get to answer some questions about the bible for health and cash, and so long as you can please the spinning bowtie guy, you'll have a pretty steady supply of health restoring items up for grabs. The only drawback to the quiz questions is that they start off really easy to lull you into a false sense of security, but after about question 40, they get really tough. They start pulling out trivia from places in the Bible I know of in name only, and other than a few lucky guesses based on grammar alone, it got more and more difficult to get rewards through this process. I've mentioned a lot of positives so far, but that's not to say that this adventure was without flaw. I ran into one very problematic symptom during the final boss fight. While I'm practically bursting at the seams to talk about the showdown, I don't want to spoil the glorious visual experience you'll encounter if you eventually face off with Satan for yourself. Anyway, during the fight, I'd hit the boss three times when the screen suddenly went black and started rolling through different color palettes of random asset tiles. After a few minutes of this, by what can only be described as divine intervention, the game miraculously accepted my select button mashing and brought up the status screen. 
A really great feature is the end game option in the menu that under normal circumstances is a fail safe for soft locking. If you get yourself stuck somewhere, you can select this and be brought to the continue screen where you can load with your most recent password, allowing you to soft reset without losing progress. Well here, because the game had gone bonkers, using the end game option gave me a cursed broken password that brought me to a black screen when I put it in. Thankfully, I had been live streaming at the time and had access to all of the passwords from the session to restore from, but I don't think I've ever seen an example where a game spits out a bad code that doesn't work after a malfunction like that. I'd say if a mildly inconvenient but hilarious glitch is the only major problem I had with the whole game, it can't be all that bad. Spiritual Warfare is by far the best game I've played by Wisdom Tree, no contest. Others like Bible Adventures and King of Kings are fun for short bursts of mildly frustrating Christian-themed platforming, but this experience was far smoother than all of those games combined. It's a full-fledged adventure with a goal that's so much more than carrying a small baby to the right or collecting sheep while being rammed to oblivion. I'll even go so far as to say that it's not only on par with, but is in some cases even better than some of the other licensed 8-bit games released officially on the NES. Yeah, there's a staggering amount of backstory to sift through to get to the game underneath, but to me at least, the undertones were always humorous and never felt preachy. If you stripped away all of the references to the Christian Bible, this could have been a well-loved hit for the system. As it is though, while I don't think it's a game that everyone would enjoy, it certainly deserves a lot more attention than it gets.